Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are uh, continuing with the discussion that we had last time, which was a response to the problems in grounding morality. This will be part two. Last time we looked at two of the five problems that we discussed earlier. Um, the first one being the problem of the fact of value distinction, and the second being the issue of determinism. In today's uh, video, I'm going to be addressing relativism, logical positivism, and existentialism. Um, most of it, however, is going to be focusing on relativism. So I will get the presentation started and we will dive in. Now, this video is a little bit longer than the last one, or should be a little bit longer than the last one, because the material that I'm covering is a little bit more extensive. Not only are we going to be going back through the arguments for relativism, but we are going to be looking at refutation of those basic arguments for relativism as well. Um, let's start by just jumping in to define um, one term, which is going to be... Of course, my computer is not responding. There we go. Uh, moral principles, what we mean by the term moral principles. We're going to talk about moral principles as the unchanging ground that lies below the changing beliefs, views, feelings, and stuff that various cultures have. So we can distinguish one as morals and one as mores. Um, so the argument, of course, for relativism is that morals are really nothing more than moral beliefs or feelings or practices of a culture. So that's the question. Is that all there is to um, morals or moral principles? Now, first thing I'm going to get into is just a general refutation of moral relativism based on a confusion that I think lies behind um, moral relativism. I think the main error with moral relativism is they're making an illicit leap from their epistemology to their metaphysics. Right, Epistemology, branch of philosophy that deals with how we know what we know, knowledge in general, whereas metaphysics deals with the questions of being reality, you know, what is actually the case. So it's a leap from basically what we believe about reality to reality itself. And it's illicit to be able to jump from one to the other. I'm going to give you two propositions that you can see on the screen. The first is I believe that murder is wrong, which is a statement about, again, my beliefs. It's not about murder. The second statement is murder is wrong. That is a statement about murder. One's epistemological, one's metaphysical. Now, the truth of each proposition depends, of course, on separate conditions. The first proposition, that I believe that murder is wrong, is true just as long as I believe that. Whereas the second statement, murder is wrong, is true based on something beyond my belief. It's actually based on whether or not murder is actually wrong in reality. So, let's take a little bit of a look at this issue of relative truth. And let's bring up another proposition. I've got it color-coded on the slide. Joe believes that it is 6 o'clock. The metaphysical proposition, well, factual proposition, let's say, it is six o'clock, is in blue. The entire proposition, Joe believes it is six o'clock, um, is the green part added to the blue part. So let's imagine, is it possible that both claims are true? Well, it seems to be possible that both claims are true because we can imagine Joe thinking that it's six o'clock or believing that it's six o'clock, and in reality, it actually is six o'clock. Another situation might be that Joe believes it's eight o'clock in which case it would be wrong or false that he believes it's 6 o'clock, and it could actually be 8 o'clock, so it would also be false that it is 6 o'clock, in which case both those statements are false. Third possibility is Joe believes that it's 6 o'clock, but it's actually 8 o'clock, in which case the statement that he believes it's 6 o'clock is true, but the statement that it is 6 o'clock would be false. And then the fourth option is that Joe actually believes it's 8 o'clock, but it is 6 o'clock, so the statement that he believes it's 6 o'clock is false, and the statement it is 6 o'clock is true. Now notice in each of these situations, the truth of the one matter is completely independent from the truth of the other statement. The belief statement or the epistemological statement is completely has a completely different criteria for determining its truth value when compared to the actual metaphysical statement about the way things actually are. Now, we jump to, again, you can't go from Joe believes X to X is therefore true for Joe. That would be the mistake. 
You can imagine another situation that has to do maybe with a moral issue, because obviously t telling time and belief in what time it is isn't a moral issue. But let's change the proposition to say that Job believes it's morally permissible to push old ladies in front of buses. Again, same basic situation. Just because Job believes that it's morally permissible to push an old lady in front of a bus doesn't imply or it doesn't follow that it actually is morally permissible to do something like that. Okay, so again, that I think is at the core of moral relativism, just as confused that be confusion be that people believe something in a culture, therefore it really is um, right, not only for that culture, but right. Okay, so let's go on and look at the arguments that we presented last time on moral relativism and then look at a refutation of each argument. And this is going to take a little bit of time. And I do have to give credit to uh, Dr. Peter Kreeft, who is the one who originally presented a lot of this material that I am um, borrowing and, 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 and using a little bit. So let's go back through the claims of moral relativism. If you remember the three claims that I gave you in the other PowerPoint, that uh, moral principles or morals are changeable, subjective, and particular, the absolutist viewpoint is going to be the exact opposite. Moral claims or moral principles um, are unchangeable, objective, and universal. Now, going back through the arguments, the first argument we presented is the psychological argument for moral relativism. And I'm going to reproduce the argument, and then I'm going to go back through and show you where the argument fails. First, the relativist argument is something along these lines, that good morality has good consequences and bad morality has bad consequences. Unhappiness and guilt are bad consequences. Happiness and self-esteem are good consequences. Now, moral absolutism produces the feelings of unhappiness and guilt. And why does it do that? Because uh, uh, moral absolutes tell us that there are certain rules that are in place, and when somebody violates one of those rules, they will or should feel guilty about that, right? Because they have actually done something that is really wrong or really bad. Whereas moral, moral relativism doesn't have that issue, because if you violate a rule or a law um, that is relativistic, then you really haven't done anything truly wrong, and therefore moral relativism produces the better feelings of happiness and self-esteem. You're not burdened with the guilt. Therefore, moral absolutism is bad and moral relativism is good. Now, you may have already thought when you first heard this argument on the other slide, or the other PowerPoint, or the other video, that this isn't the best argument. And let's actually break it down to show why it's not a very good argument. Number one, <clears throat> absolute moral laws, we could assume, or at least imagine, that they could exist not to cause unhappiness, but actually to maximize happiness. You can imagine that these laws are there to protect you in a certain sense, the way a warning sign um, or a road map is there to kind of guide you through life. We can imagine that moral absolutes, again, produce realistic guilt when something actually wrong has happened. Okay, and removing absolute guilt, of course, does remove guilt, or removes the absolute, uh, absolutes removes guilt, but that only uh, takes care of maybe short-term happiness, not necessarily long-term happiness. So as long as the guilt is realistic and not pathological, then the guilt may serve a very good function of guiding you through life, very much the same way physical pain um, helps you protect your body. That guilt is there to kind of protect you as a person. Okay, so that's, that's a possibility, right? So guilt is not necessarily a bad thing, which undercuts the basic argument. Number two, the relativist argument kind of begs the question, because it assumes that our feelings, how we feel about something, is a standard for judging morality. And that's the exact opposite of what traditional morality has always stood for. Traditional morality has always assumed that it's the morality that is there to be a judge of our feelings. And I think that makes a lot of sense, because feelings, of course, are relative to individuals. One person feels one way, another person feels another way. And number three, of course, if the self-esteem versus guilt argument is correct, then a person who perhaps is a rapist or a cannibal or a terrorist, as long as they feel better about what they've done than a person who feels guilty about what they've done, then they're actually morally on a better footing, okay? Because they have self-esteem rather than the guilt. And you can see how that implication follows. Okay, so that's the first argument, the psychological argument. 
Let's take a look at the cultural influence argument. And again, here's the relativist argument first, that values are things that differ with respect to culture, and therefore moral rightness differs with respect to culture. And in a nutshell, this is the most common argument, I think, for moral relativism, is that we look at various cultures and notice that there are differences and therefore simply conclude that therefore what's right and wrong differs as well. Of course, you can't get to the conclusion that moral rightness differs with respect to culture from the mere premise that values are things that differ with respect to culture. Because there's an unstated premise, and this is our first problem. The unstated premise, pe premise in this argument is that moral rightness is a matter of obedience to cultures, a culture's values. Now that would have to be the premise in order to get from the first premise to the conclusion. In other words, what you'd have to accept as true is that it's always right to obey your culture's values. And how many people would actually accept that as a premise? Most people would believe that we, on occasion, should criticize or reject what our cultures say is right or wrong. And we could restate the cultural statement with or restate the cultural argument with the premise included, and I've done it on the next slide, that values are things that differ with respect to culture. Moral rightness is obedience to your culture's values, therefore moral rightness differs with respect to culture. And I broke down on the, on the slide below that kind of the argument into a little bit more of a step-by-step -step process so that you can see how you get through those premises to the conclusion very tightly and see that it is a valid argument. Now, the hidden premise that we just added right here, moral rightness is obedience to your culture's values, again begs the question in favor of relativism because it presupposes moral relativism in order to prove moral relativism. Let's just go back and look at that premise. Moral rightness is obedience to your culture's values. Again, that is the relativist position, and that is what needs to be proven. That's what needs to be argued for. You can't start with that in your premises to lead you to relativism. It is a circular argument. It begs the question, and it's not a good argument. Moral absolutism denies that it's always right, of course, to, to obey your culture's values. There are times when you should challenge your culture's values. See, absolutism has the advantage of giving what might be a transcultural standard, a universal standard, something that we could actually judge cultural values by. Transcultural uh, standard enables you to critique cultural values. In fact, one can't critique cultural values without one. If that's all you are, is stuck with your culture's values, then you can't get beyond that. You're stuck in that box. And only the absolutist on that ground could be progressive, could be moving towards a better morality and challenge you know, ways of the past as we progress. The relativist is forced to just kind of maintain the status quo. And the absolutist, of course, is in a position to judge certain things as right or wrong. You could think of the Nuremberg trials after World War II, where the Nazis were tried for you know, crimes against humanity, essentially, with the Holocaust. And... If all we have is a relativistic standard, um, that would be uh, enough, I think, to justify the Nazis' um, actions. You know, they were only doing what they were told to do, what was legal to do, what was given to them to do within their culture. But the people that tried those Nazis um, were taking the stance that there are certain rights and wrongs that transcend the culture. And that's the reason that they could be found guilty of the crimes that they committed. Next problem with the cultural argument is there's some equivocation, again, when we talk about the term values. Again, equivocation means we're using a term in more than one way. And the relativist is failing to distinguish the word values from value opinions. When they use the word values, um, they're using you know, that for both value opinions and actual moral principles at the same time. And the absolutist, of course, wants to distinguish that. There are subjective opinions about values and then objectively true values, and we don't want to confuse them. Different cultures may have different opinions about moral values, but it doesn't follow that what is really right in one culture is really wrong in another. Any more than you know, different opinions about what happens after death can be true um, with respect to what actually happens after death. Okay, the third problem with the cultural influence, you notice there's several problems here, is there's disagreement um, between cultures, but it doesn't mean ideas are relative. Okay, disagreement doesn't prove relativity. So the relativist argument, again, is that across the world people tend to 
disagree over moral codes, where they do tend to agree when it comes to things like science. And the two arguments that we presented before were these. Number one, that science is objective, obviously. And across the world, people tend to agree with science. Therefore, across the world, people tend to agree with what is objective. And then argument two, since objective facts are things people tend to agree with, and moral codes are things people tend to disagree with, therefore, moral codes are not objective and are therefore relative. Now, the problem is essentially with argument two. The major premise of argument two, which is all objective facts, and I may not say that here, it says objective facts are things people agree with, and the implication is we're talking about all objective facts are things people agree with. And if we spell it out that way, it seems less than true, right? All objective facts are things people agree with. That does seem to be false. There are some objective facts that people do not agree with, and we can look at the case historically, for instance, heliocentricity. If that's, an objective, if that's an objective fact, of course, there was a time when people didn't hold to heliocentricity and preferred a geocentric model. Um, even today, when we talk about the quantum um, theory, there's all kinds of different competing theories uh, from string theory and on. Now, the possible relativist response to this would be, yeah, geocentricity, heliocentricity, that was in the past, right? And people tend to agree today that heliocentricity is the case. In other words, that science, when it comes to science, people tend to disagree across time, but we tend to agree across space today. To which we could respond that in morality, people may disagree across space, but they generally agree throughout time. And when it comes down to issues of time versus space, neither one is relevant to the moral argument, right? Time and space do not determine whether something is true or false or right or wrong. So what's the difference if it's the way they used to see things versus the way they see things now, any more than they see things in that place differently than we see things in this place, okay? Kind of misses the point. Anyways, the argument fails because we do disagree over objective facts too, and if that's the case, then of course if we disagree over morality, it could just be another objective fact that we're disagreeing about. Number four, the appeal to facts actually doesn't have the facts completely right. Right? The whole argument is that different cultures disagree when it comes to values. And the fact is that cultures don't totally disagree when it comes to values or even their value opinions. Um, we may place def different emphases on certain values or virtues, such as courage, that was incredibly valued in the ancient world, maybe more so than today, that we still value it today. Uh, perhaps we place more tolerance, uh, value on tolerance in the modern world than they did in the past. But again, tolerance is still uh, generally considered a good thing and could be considered an objectively good thing. But no society holds, of course, cardinal virtues, the famous ones that we get out of the ancient Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, things like justice and courage and wisdom and temperance as morally evil. You can't even imagine those virtues as morally evil. Just try to imagine a society that believed cowardice was just as good as bravery or that stupidity was just as valuable as wisdom. Okay, That doesn't happen. Everybody knows that these things are good. Now, what those look like, you know, what does justice look like in this country or you know, culture and what does justice look like in that culture? There may be disagreements as to, you know, what is the just action or what is the just decision, but every culture values justice. Now, beneath all moral disagreements, there exists ultimately a deeper foundational morality, and that's what we're getting at here. In fact, moral disagreements are impossible without some deeper moral agreements. We can look at examples around the world in different cultural religions where we see things like the golden rule. It's found everywhere, maybe in a different way that it's phrased, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or don't do unto others as you would not want others to do to you. Um, you can imagine in a debate over capital punishment, both sides in that debate actually recognize murder as a true bad and, or, yeah, an evil, but the debate is, again, whether or not we should put the murderer to death, and again, both sides value life and see the importance of that. When you look at the Holocaust, you can think about the Nazis. 
in their atrocities, you know, putting people to death in thousands and millions. Um, and it's interesting when you look historically at the effort that was given um, to dehumanize the Jews. Um, the idea of herding them naked into railroad cars and the way that they would treat them like cattle, like animals, um, had a psychological impact on the Germans that were uh, then carrying out the orders that are coming down to them. It'd be very difficult to do what the Germans did if there wasn't a whole process to dehumanize them in the eyes of the uh, executioners. If they saw them as people, then there would be something that we recognize as wrong about harming innocent people. Next argument is a social conditioning argument, and here is, again, the relativist's argument. Society conditions values in its members, and what is produced by a human subject is subjective or relative. So values are subjective and relative. First problem, again, we're equivocating on the term values, confusing it with value opinions. Society actually does condition value opinions. But this does not imply it conditions values, unless values are nothing more then value opinions. And that's, again, what needs to be proven. So this is another way that we're begging the question in favor of relativism. The second problem is there's a false assumption that, we'll, that whatever we learn from society must be subjective. Of course, there are lots of, lots of things we learn from society. You can talk about the rules of a game like football. The rules are obviously man-made. They're obviously conventional. They're created. And we can learn these. But it's false that everything we learn is subjective because we also learn many objective things. If you ever study something like logic or mathematics, you're dealing with something that is very much objective and merely discovered by man, not created. Thus, the fact that we learn something from society does not prove that what we have learned is subjective. And that, again, undercuts the argument. Third problem is the main premise that society conditions values in its members is not always true, even in their value opinions. Some value opinions are not the result of conditioning, and if they were, there would be no dissension from the common view within a culture, no nonconformity. But, of course, there is nonconformity all the time within a culture. Many people disagree with their culture's values, and you can imagine, again, the pri you know, prior to the Civil War and the abolition of slavery in the United States, that there are a good number of abolitionists that were willing to uh, stand up against something they saw as unjust, even though it was legal in the society and considered uh, morally permissible by many. So some values are obviously not the result of conditioning. Okay. Now we're going to get on to some of the, I think, easier arguments to maybe lay out. And when you get to one of the essays in the course, if you're taking this as a course um, that I'm giving, um, you'll be asked to present certain arguments for relativism. And I would say you can go with some of these because I think they're straightforward and usually pretty easy to summarize. The argument from freedom. Here's the relativist argument. Moral relativism is the only way that we can actually guarantee freedom because you can't be truly free if you're not able to create for yourself your own values. If meaning and morality is imposed on us from outside, of course, that would mean we're not free. Now, immediately you may think that's kind of a weak argument just because, you know, something's imposed on me from the outside. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not free in certain ways. I mean, do I have to be as free as all that to create my own morality? And even though I want to be free, it doesn't mean that I necessarily have the power to do such a thing. Now, the first response is what I'd call the ad hominem rebuttal, where we actually attack the man in a certain way, kind of put the uh, relativist uh, to a, a certain question. And you can say something like this. If, I, if you have the right to be free to create your own morals, then why can I be free to create my morals? And then I can create whatever morals I see fit, and I choose, of course, to create a society where your views are restricted and only mine are permitted, or um, something along those lines. Of course, the relativist is going to respond by saying they object to something like that, um, possibly on the grounds that it's not just, it's not fair, it's not right. Now, in doing so, of course, they're acknowledging certain standard values that we would consider absolute, such as truth, justice, and so on. Of course, they could come out with a different response, which would be to protest on an alternative value system, right? Well, that's not true for me. And then the consequence is simply a matter of 
your protest versus my protest. And you're not going to settle an argument about what's right and wrong if there is relativity when it comes to right and wrong to settle some kind of disagreement. That way it's going to resort, of course, to some kind of force. Whoever is the stronger will oppose their morality. And of course, once you have force brought into the matter, then we're not talking about freedom anymore because force removes freedom from the situation. Of course, that's not a real rebuttal, but it does put a little bit of pressure on the relevists to think about the implications of their view. Now, the second response is that freedom cannot create values for the simple reason that freedom presupposes them. And I think this is uh, a knockdown argument against the freedom argument. The argument that relativism guarantees freedom assumes, of course, that freedom is objectively good. If freedom is really good, then it must be freedom from something that is actually bad. So it you know, assumes that objective standard. And those who advocate freedom insist, of course, that all people are given freedom. And therefore, they hold to another value, which is the value of equality. You can't argue for freedom without ultimately holding it as a true value, not just a relative value. A third response we can call the experiential response. Uh, experience does show us that we're free to create mores, right? You know, our cultural standards, rules uh, for socially acceptable dress, speech, um, cuisine, the ways we speak. Um, experience also shows us that we're not really free to create morals. It's very difficult to say that more murder or rape can be called good or noble, where justice and kindness can simply be termed to be bad or evil. If we could, we'd not feel bound right, by those types of rules. Um, one would not have any more guilt about murder than about changing the number of points or in a touchdown in a base, sorry, football game. They don't have touchdowns in baseball, do they? Um, but of course, we do feel bound this way, right? We can't make hatred good or love evil. We can only hate or love, which people unfortunately do. The hate part, love part's good. Um, we can murder, but we can't experience an obligation to murder. There does seem to be something different about those types of things. Now, one of the most popular arguments, and I think I may have mentioned this on any other video, is the argument of uh, dealing with tolerance. The relativist argument, again, is that moral relativism is tolerant, whereas absolutism is intolerant. Tolerance, of course, being good, intolerance being bad. Therefore, relativism is good and absolutism is bad. Or one's right and one's wrong if you want to convert you know, good and bad to right and wrong. Now, the first response we could say is the definition of tolerance is a little suspect here. Um, the argument uses the term, I think, incorrectly because tolerance is generally a quality that you would find in a person and not in an idea. Ideas can be clear, ideas can be poorly defined or well-defined, not tolerant or intolerant. So a person, for instance, could tolerate no dissent from a rather unclear view of things, while another person may tolerate a lot of dissent from very clearly defined views. There's a difference between the ideas and the person that holds them. So that's the first problem. The second problem is objectivism does not necessarily cause intolerance. Relativist, relativist claims absolutism leads to intolerance of alternative views. And that's obviously not the case historically when it comes to science, which deals, again, with very objective matters. Science has made a lot of progress due to tolerance of different ideas and the ability to be open to debating these ideas. Again, science is not about subjectivity, it's about objectivity. So objectivism doesn't necessarily cause intolerance or the scientific community would be one of the most intolerant of new ideas. And historically, that's just not the case. Number three, absolutes may be unyielding, but the defender of them doesn't have to be unyielding, right? The claim is that absolutes are unyielding, so the defender is gonna have that same type of attitude, and that just doesn't follow. How you promote a particular idea is very different from the idea itself. You know, I could teach something in a very hard way um, when I'm dealing with maybe some kind of soft facts um, or opinions. Or I could teach very hard facts in a very gentle way, in a soft way. So, again, it doesn't follow. And again, like the freedom argument, the fourth one is the value of tolerance. Again, tolerance assumes, the tolerance argument rather, assumes that tolerance is a real objective good. 
the relativist could possibly respond and say, well, ah, no, I don't assume that tolerance is objectively valuable. In which case, you could respond to that by saying, then you're trying to impose just a subjective value when you tell me that I need to be more tolerant. And of course, it seems fairly intolerant to try to force a subjective view on me, even more so than a universal value. And if there's no moral value uh, is absolute, then of course neither is tolerance. Only the ab absolutists can seriously advocate tolerance, whereas um, the relativists cannot. Number five, on relativism, you can always ask the question, why should we be tolerant? And I don't think the relativists can answer this question. Is it because it just feels better to be tolerant? Well, feelings change. They're different from person to person. Or maybe it's popular to be tolerant. But of course, what's popular today might be unpopular tomorrow, or vice versa. Relativists has nothing to which they can appeal. What is there to stop a tolerant nation from sliding into intolerance over time? Nothing. However, the absolutists can appeal to some kind of universal law. You just take the example of the uh, homosexual community, for instance. Uh, historically, the homosexual community has opposed absolutism um, for good reasons, fearing that it's possibly going to lead to intolerance of certain behaviors. And we can understand that. However, the homosexual community also depends on absolutism as the only real protection against the intolerance directed towards their persons. Right? Because it would be an absolutist position to say um, that you should not assault people based on their um, sexual preferences. Okay? And of course, they'll hold to absolutism where it's necessary and relativism where it's necessary. And of course, rationally and logically, you can't have both. Either absolutism is true or relativism is true. Number six, the meaning of tolerance. It presupposes moral objectivism. Right? Not only is it assumed to be an actual absolute objective good, but it presupposes that there is something that is morally good because no one tolerates what is bad. I'm sorry, what is good. Right? We don't speak of tolerating love or tolerating beauty or tolerating justice or tolerating wisdom. You know, the word itself implies that what you're tolerating is objectively bad. You only tolerate evil in order to pre pre uh, prevent worse evil which actually goes into this case about what we should or should not tolerate. Sometimes it's worth tolerating certain evils. Um, other times there are things that we should not tolerate, and we have to have wisdom when deciding what to do. Obviously, you know, a cancer patient, for instance, uh, might tolerate some severe sickness caused by chemotherapy with the hope that it's going to produce some kind of cure. Uh, other people may tolerate smoking to preserve the good of freedom um, in our society. So again, tolerance is of something bad for the sake of something good. And then, of course, there's the dilemma of cross-cultural tolerance. And most cultures have actually not seen tolerance as a good thing. Their uh, personal value opinions may not have held it a very high standard. Um, some people and cultures see tolerance as a weakness, whereas intolerance is a strength. Now, the question, of course, is that comes up a lot is, you know, should we tolerate intolerance? And it seems like you want to say, yes, if you're saying tolerance is good, then you should tolerate intolerance. Um, but is that right, right? Should the tolerance objectivists actually not criticize evil, such as fascist dictatorships, the Spanish Inquisition? We could think of a lot of things um, that are intolerant um, that you not, wouldn't necessarily want to tolerate even if you value tolerance. So I think it's consistent to actually answer the question, should we tolerate intolerance with the answer of no? And we could say that on the basis that tolerance is a true good. And intolerance, therefore, would actually be really wrong. So again, we could presuppose a universal transcultural value in tolerance and still not stand for intolerance. Number seven, tolerance argument, again, is a non sequitur, doesn't follow from the premises. So, for instance, if belief in absolute moral values causes intolerance, it doesn't follow that such values aren't real. And you can put it into a kind of a logical form like this. If A, then I, right? If absolute values, then intolerance. Therefore, there's no absolute values. That's a shorthand version of the argument that we've just presented. And, of course, that's not a valid argument. You could substitute some other concepts into that same argument form, and you'll see the absurdity of it. It's like saying belief that that cop is asleep caused the mugger to strike, therefore the cop is not asleep. 
Again, that doesn't make any sense. That's why it sounds bizarre when you listen to it. Very bad argument. Moving on to situationalism and motivationalism, which, again, are grouped together. The relativist argument is that morality depends on the situation. Situations determine morality. Situations are relative. Therefore, morality is relative. And the other one is that morality is subjective since it's based on motive, and motive is a matter of morality is a matter of motive. Motive is, of course, subjective, therefore morality is subjective. So I think I mentioned that that sounds like a pretty good argument. So we need to look at that and see where this one goes off. First, the viewpoint of the situational relativist. The situationalist basically finds all morality relative to the situation, where the motivationist finds all morality relative to the motive of the individual. And we need to make a necessary distinction because morality is partly determined. We could say it's conditioned by situations and motives, but it's not wholly determined, I think, by those two things. There are three components to morality in the classical scholastic realist view, for instance. And the three determinants or factors that influence whether any action is good or bad are these. First, you have the nature of the act itself, what you're actually doing. The situation would come in second, that in which the act is done, when, where, how, one might do it. And then, of course, the motive for acting, which is the reason why you act. Now, all three really need to be considered to determine whether or not an act is morally right or morally wrong. For instance, doing the right thing for the wrong situation, for the wrong motive, is not good. You can imagine a husband making love to his wife being a good act, but it wouldn't be a good act if it was medically dangerous to do so at that time. So the situation would have some role to play. Or you can imagine giving money to the poor as a good act, but if you're doing it to show off your wealth or for some kind of tax benefit, and our motives are questionable, and we would take that into consideration whether we determine the action good or bad. You can even make an analogy with art. That good life is like a work of art. It should have a, a number of different factors, right? Good art requires all the essential elements to be good, such as a good story plot, characters, um, etc. And we could say a good life should have uh, a, co a combination of you know doing the right things in the right way for the right reasons. It's a more robust view, I think, of ethics when you look at the, those three factors. And again, all three would have to be relative for morality to be relative. There must be an act before it can qualify as subjective, be qualified rather by subjective motives or relative situations. And that's simply not the case for all three of these, if you think about it carefully. For instance, the act itself is always an objective element. There's just a fact of the matter when it comes to the act. The situation truly is a relative element, because situations are relative, but situations are also objective. Right? They're not subjective just because they're relative. So principles may be applied differently to different situations, but it actually presupposes the validity of the principles we start with. Next, we have the motive, which is subjective because it's my motive or it's your motive. So the motive is subjective, but again, motives tend to fall under some kind of category of moral absolutes because we tend to think of certain motives as right and certain motives as wrong. Right? The motive to aid somebody is usually looked at as a good motive, whereas the motive to harm somebody is generally judged to be evil. So, it's not true that morality is relative, because we can't find relativity that extends all the way through all three elements. Um, of course, a flexible application of moral principles doesn't make the principles themselves relative. Moral principles may be applied flexibly to different situations, but again, applying things flexibly already assumes that there's some kind of standard and that the standard is rigid. If the standard is just as flexible as a situation, then of course it's not a standard at all. Number two, uh, situationalism and motivationalism are actually self-refuting because each claims that morality is subjective and relative. Situationalism is itself, of course, an objective morality and motivationalism is itself a universal morality. So they self-defeat at that level. The next was the argument from consequences. This is basically a pragmatic argument. Consequences are a relative indicator, I think, of right and wrong. Relativists may argue that absolutism from the supposed consequence of intolerance, where an absolutist may argue that relative, against relativism from the real consequence that there is no real value of tolerance. 
good morality should have good consequences and bad morality should have bad consequences. Oh, by the way, I'm going through this so quickly, I forgot to point out that last argument on situationalism and motivationalism was the last of the relativist arguments that we're refuting. What I'm presenting now are the arguments for moral absolutism. Okay, so this is a new series of arguments. Um, and again, you can judge whether these are, are, are you know, solid arguments, but again, they're going to at least try to make a case for absolutism. And again, the first is the consequence argument. So again, the idea here is not that good morality has good art, good consequences and bad morality has bad consequences. That sounds a lot like the first argument we started with from relativism, but it's that morality should have good consequences and bad morality should have bad consequences. Now, the main consequence of mo uh, moral relativism is actually the removal of deterrence. The consequence of if it feels good, then do it, is just to do whatever feels good. And all immoral acts, unfortunately, happen to be things that feel pretty good. As a matter of fact, people wouldn't do things that are immoral unless there was some kind of pleasure um, that was derived from it or some kind of good that was viewed in it. Whether or not it was actually good is a different question. And I think that's true of all actions. We always do what we think is the most pleasurable or the best in our view, even though our view can sometimes be wrong. On an individual level, of course, relativism has never produced a truly virtuous person, whereas on a societal level, it's never produced an absolutely good society. Of course, it has produced a lot of bad societies, and we can, again, just point to the 20th century for some examples, like Nazi Germany, Communist China, or Fascist Italy. In fact, here's a quote from Benito Mussolini showing how what he developed in Italy um, in the earlier 20th century is a direct result of relativism. He says, everything I have said and done in these last years is relativism by intuition. From the fact that all ideologies are of equal value, that all ideologies are mere fictions, the modern relativist infers that everybody has the right to create for himself his own ideology and to attempt to enforce it with all the energy of which he is capable. If relativism signifies contempt for fixed categories and men who claim to be the bearers of an objective immortal truth, then there is nothing more relativistic than fascism. I think that says a lot. Of course, the main consequence of moral absolutism is not the removal of deterrence, but it provides moral deterrence. Not everything that feels good should be done. Some acts that feel good ought not to be done, such as rape, murder, and theft. On an individual level, you have had people that have been basically classified as generally virtuous people. You could look at Socrates, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother, Mother Teresa. On a societal level, absolutism has produced what we may say are relatively good societies, not that any society is perfect, but uh, ancient China under the ideas of Confucius, uh, Israel perhaps under the Mosaic Law um, compared to its neighbors, and America overall in its position today. Next is the argument from tradition. Absolutism is what we call traditional morality. Traditional morality has always been absolutistic. Uh, traditional morality is also egalitarian. Egalitarianism extended into history because it gives people the say that are no longer with us. Relativism, of course, would be elitism because it only makes up for a tiny minority of the popula uh, population and a tiny minority of the opinion when it comes to um, morality. Relativists must believe that nearly all people in history have ordered their lives by an illusion if they're right about relativism. Now, absolutism is not elite like that. It really is egalitarian because tradition is the norm when it comes to human society and human history. And G.K. Chesterton has a nice little quote when he calls um, you know, tradition the democracy of the dead because it extends, again, a vote or a franchise back to those who are not um, able to vote, uh, not by accident of birth, but by accident of death. Tradition counters the minority opinion of those who just happen to still be alive, which, again, is always going to be a minority of the people who have always lived. So that's kind of interesting. I don't think it's a knockdown argument, but it's, it's interesting. Next is an argument uh, called the moral experience argument. And it's really the simplest argument because it's primary data. What's our immediate experience when it comes to moral obligation, or at least the feeling of moral obligation? If you're going to deny you know, the primary data, it requires a philosophy that denies reality, um, you know, immediately perceived by our senses. You know, moral absolutism is basically empirical. Relativism, I don't think, is. The foundational moral experience, we could say, is generally absolutistic. And it's like coming up against a wall. It's like we feel something um, that is 
um, imposing something on us, maybe from outside. Um, of course, that's why we use words like we ought, we should, what's right, what's wrong, that kind of language when it comes to these experiences. Moral absolutism is based on the experience of this feeling of moral obligation. And the example we can give is, say you promise a friend that you're going to help him move. He's going to move early on a Saturday morning. You're exhausted from whatever went on during the week. And when Saturday morning arrives, of course, you hear the alarm go off and you're exhausted. And you've got two things that you experience at the same time. You've got the desire to sleep and you've got this feeling of obligation that's pulling you to get up. And each of those experiences is ultimately different, right? There's no sense of obligation to sleep and we don't seem to have a desire to get up. Each experience is also pulling you from a different direction. The feeling of you know, desiring to sleep seems to pull on us from inside, whereas the idea of obligation to get up is pulling on us from outside. So that experience itself is best explained by absolutism. Right? Desire is internal to the agent. It moves us as a source. We could say it drives us as an efficient cause of our actions, whereas moral obligation seems external to the actor or the agent, where it's pulling us as an end, uh, or we might call it moving us as a final cause, to use kind of Aristotelian terminology. Next argument is an ad hominem. And this one, again, is very persuasive on an emotional level. Relativists, like others, react and protest when they're treated in a certain way. If they're treated unjustly or immorally or unfairly, they tend to react by protest. So, for example, a relativist who's unfaithful to his wife and leaves her for another woman will often, often appeal to relativistic principles that, you know, I have to do what's right for me to justify that action. But when the shoe's on the other foot and his wife leaves him for another man, then he would protest, saying that there's something wrong that has been done seems that relativism ends up being more personal than philosophical. One's actual view, and this is the kicker, I think one's actual view is not revealed by what we do. Our actual beliefs are never indicated by the behaviors we undertake, but by the reactions we have when certain things are done to us. That reveals what our true beliefs are. Now, there's a contradiction between theory and practice. It's evident that every act of defending relativism, it's, it actually it is evident in every act of defending relativism. Why do relatives write in defense of relativism? Well, to convince other people that relativism is right and absolutism is wrong. And of course, you could ask, is it really right or really wrong? And if so, then there is such a thing as a real right and a real wrong. And if not, then there's nothing wrong with being an absolutist any more than there's anything really right about being a relativist. Last one is the moral, I think this is the last one, I haven't looked ahead, is the moral language argument. We use moral language, right, all the time. We have disagreements about moral issues. We quarrel. Um, we debate about what's right and what's wrong. And of course, that's to act as if we believe there's something objective, universally binding when it comes to moral principles. If the argument was only a matter of subjective desires, then it would be as silly as arguing about the taste of a meal. You know, chocolate ice cream is the best. No, it isn't. Um, that would be a silly argument to undertake. Of course, the argument involves statements like, this isn't fair, what right do you have? You know, things that are a little bit more serious than the taste of food. And if relativism is true, a moral argument would be no different than arguing, like I said, about taste. So let's skip over that section. So moral language ultimately would be meaningless if relativism were true. Whereas our common language every day does bestow praise on people and blame, uh, counsels on what you should or should not do. And we tend not to praise or blame machines. Machines are not moral agents. Um, when a psychologist says that we're just complex machines, you know, are we really uh, worthy of being blamed or praised for anything that we do? If that really is the situation, we talked, about, talked a lot about that when we did determinism. However, we do seem to think that moral language is meaningful. We all know how to use it and we all use it. And that would imply that relativism is not true. Um, the fact that we use moral, moral language implies that absolutism seems to be uh, a better ex explanation for things. Okay. That's a lot of material, and I apologize the way I went through that kind of me mechanically. I don't like doing that when I lecture, but I wanted to get through it kind of quickly. Hopefully, I, I added enough of my own commentary as we went along 
that you're able to get the point of what I was saying. Um, if not, I would go back through the PowerPoint, take your time, try to think through these arguments and understand really how an argument works, first of all, and then how an argument can possibly fail. Uh, generally, either it's invalid or there's a premise that's false or an implication that's not really um, drawn out that um, is relevant. Last two things that I want to go through, I think I'm going to be a little bit quicker on. Uh, the logical positivist, uh, we talked about the position um, from, it's, it's more of a historical issue, like I said. It's not so popular today as it was early in the 20th century. But the um, question with logical positivism uh, had to do with meaningfulness of statements. And the criteria that they give made it appear, of course, that moral language couldn't possibly be meaningful. And let me just go back through both the principle behind logical positivism and the argument that applies to morality. We call this the uh, uh, principle of empirical verifiability or the verification principle. And it states that there are only, again, two types of meaningful propositions. Number one, those that are simply true by definition, which we might call analytic statements. And two, those that are empirically verifiable, which we might call synthetic statements. Of course, moral claims, and this is the problem, are not true by definition and moral claims are not empirically verifiable. So when I say it's wrong to murder, that's not true by definition, nor is it something that I can look at and actually see the wrongfulness in that. And since it doesn't, the claim murder is wrong or any moral claim doesn't fit those two, either of those two criteria, then moral claims, of course, cannot be judged as meaningful. Of course, the implication for moral philosophy is moral claims end up being cognitively empty. At best, they may be emotive expressions or emotive commands. You know, this is what I don't, this is what I don't like, um, and I think this is what you should do, um, but that's just my opinion on the matter. Now, the cool thing about the logical positivist is we could respond to it in a very simple way. Um, by going back to the principle itself, the verification principle. And this was uh, noticed to be the fatal flaw in logical positivism. And here's what it is. The principle of empirical verifiability is itself neither true by definition nor empirically verifiable, right? It sets up those as the two criteria to determine if something is meaningful. Yet the proposition that it gives of itself is it fails both of those qualifications. Therefore, by its own system, it is not meaningful. So it's a self-defeating claim, um, essentially, and it can be easily dismissed. So that's all I have to say about logical positivism. Um, the last thing is existentialism. And we talked about this idea of radical freedom with existentialism, that existentialism stresses freedom over rationality. And it's this absolute concept of freedom. Reason can't, of course, compel one to act in one way or another. Reason only is an authority if we choose to give it the authority over us. Therefore, our freedom is primary, rationality secondary, because we're not rational by nature, but we're rational by choice. Okay, and we said, oh, well, let me just finish going through this slide. Uh, the main mo motto that you'll see a lot uh, for existentialism, that existence precedes essence. Ultimately, they don't recognize such thing as a human nature or an essence, uh, the way we talked about when we did Aristotle last time, um, that determines you know, our, our decisions, choices, actions, and things like that. Rather, the decisions, choices, and actions that we make really define us as human beings and constitute the nature that we kind of put upon ourselves. Now, the moral implication that we saw last time was that since we choose our own moral code as autonomous beings, the moral code is very much subjective. And being that way, it can't actually make us do anything. We could say it's non-binding. And a code can't tell us what to do in any actual situation, because if we really are truly free, then we're free to throw off whatever binds we try to put on upon ourselves in the codes that we come up with. And I think I also use the example of handcuffs. You know, if I'm coming up with my own moral code to kind of govern my actions, um, if I'm free enough to make that moral code, I'm free enough to throw off that moral code. So it's like taking a pair of handcuffs and slapping them on myself and believing that I'm truly bound if I still kept the key in my hand. No, I could take the handcuffs off at any time. That's not truly being bound. Now, one of the other side effects of existential philosophy, at least atheistic existentialism, is this issue that comes up of meaninglessness. And of course, that has a lot to do with ethics. And I'm talking meaninglessness. I'll just say it's the decision uh, that the decisions and occurrences of life are devoid of any 
ultimate significance, okay, or real significance. Any sensation of meaning is at most a useful delusion, or at least merely appears to um, you know me as um, a subjective meaning, not a universal. Purposelessness is the idea that there's no real direction or goal in life. That life is just one event after another, and I could determine for myself my own purpose, which would follow from the freedom. I could choose my own meaning. I could choose my own purpose, and they become ultimately subjective at that time, which is fine. Some people have no problem with that. Other people think if there's no real universal meaning or purpose, um, then it's less than real. Now, we could talk about creating versus finding meaning as the two um, issues. You know, it's an ongoing debate among existentialists. Are we meaning seekers or are we meaning creators? And this is what I was talking about a second ago. And it becomes a theological question ultimately. It's connected to our worldview and our beliefs about ultimate reality. As meaning seekers, of course, it assumes human life is inherently meaningful and that we can discover it. Whereas if you're a meaning creator or believe that we're meaning creators, it assumes that we're able to create our own meaning. And the extreme position says there's ultimately no ultimate real meaning beyond that which is created on the individual level. Now, the reason um, I'm going in and calling this, these slides, you know, God and meaning is because what I'm going to present to you is kind of a contrast between atheistic existentialism and a possible alternative view of reality that we might find rooted in theism, uh, just as a different way to look at things. Um, meaning in existentialism is going to be descriptive, right? Unlike the prescriptive conception of the meaning of life, and when we talk prescriptive, when we say the meaning of life, we're saying that they're... Um, is something that we ought to be pursuing. Uh, meaning is something only for the individual on the descriptive level. So to mean implies that there's something to be learned from something else. And since subjects mean different things to every individual, meaning is, like I said, purely subjective. Now let's contrast the theistic and existential worldviews. Existentialism um, is going to prize, again, autonomy and absolute freedom over meaning. It's going to see these two things as um, you know, not being able to coexist in a, in a true way. So, one, it's more important to them to be autonomous than to have purpose. So the freedom is paramount, like we said. Number two, they see religion as something that might provide purpose, but at the expense of true autonomy. You're not really free um, in those kinds of contexts. Now, the theist would reject these, okay? Theism provides objective meaning and tries to preserve freedom at the same time, according to some views of theists, okay? So let's look at the way it might reject one and two that we just looked at right here. Meaning and autonomy, they would view as necessary, both necessary, for the best existence. And meaning and autonomy are compatible on the theist view. So let's look at a refutation of thesis one, that freedom is more important than meaning. First, let's some, use some definitions. Autonomy, meaning self-governance, the ability to choose on the basis of good reasons rather than to be forced from without. All right, that can I, be, I can make my own laws on the basis of good reasons. And when I use the word meaning, it's the idea that there is some purpose to life, that there's some intrinsic rationale uh, to life or even value to life. Now, it seems to be the case that purposes could be good or bad or neutral. There's all kinds of different purposes. So, for instance, a bad purpose would be you know, poisoning somebody, um, poisoning food to kill somebody. A neutral purpose might be just twiddling your thumbs to pass the time. It's neither good nor bad, sort of indifferent, whereas a good purpose might be to feed the poor. Now, autonomy, which is a good seems to be superior to bad or neutral purposes because it does have a positive value, whereas bad and neutral purposes don't. But autonomy, of course, may be better than some good purposes because good purposes come at different lengths and autonomy seems to be fairly valuable. But autonomy does not seem to be better than all good purposes, right? Freedom can't be understood apart from purposiveness because when I talk about freedom, to be free is to be able to do act A willingly in order to get result R. That's what we think of when we talk about freedom, that there's still some kind of end in mind, some kind of purpose or goal, or freedom would be pointless. Now, autonomy can't be just some kind of unjustified absolute good, good for the sake of itself and not just 
good for something else, which is what I think it is. So we can imagine a basic thought experiment where you have two different situations. In situation A, let's imagine you've got 100% autonomy to make your own rules and decisions, etc. But you're in great misery because you're locked in a room and the room is being filled with a slow-acting poisonous gas. Then there's situation B, where you have reduced autonomy, let's say 90%. There are certain things that are forbidden from you, like murder and rape or something along those lines. But you're locked in a different type of room, which happens to be filled with your favorite foods. Which situation would you actually choose? Most people would pick room B. I think most people reasonably would pick room B, because autonomy is not the only thing of value. Many would be willing to give up some degree of freedom for a gain in happiness. Because again, it seems like freedom has an ultimate goal or a higher end, which would be happiness. And that's the view of many historical moral philosophers throughout the years. So for a good people, I'm sorry, for a good purpose, most would be willing to give up a small degree of freedom. Refutation of thesis two is this, that religion always places purpose above autonomy or removes autonomy. And I think that's a, a misunderstanding of some of the goals of some religions. And you know, I'm not going to speak for every religion. I'm just going to use one religion as an example just to make the point. And I'll choose Christianity because there is this idea of um, meaning and freedom coexisting in certain passages. So let's just take a quick look at John 8:32. It says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The Christian theistic view exactly sees meaning and freedom as united in this instance. Uh, claims to offer a truth about the world and true beliefs are going to be useful for attaining certain goals and purposes. So autonomy is actually increased when you have truth regarding the purpose of life. So if we know why we're here, if we know what our options really are, then it's going to allow us to make more intelligent and wiser choices regard, regarding our ultimate um, goals and ends. So again, theism does not just ab abandon um, freedom at all. It actually tries to unite the two. So I know that is a lot of stuff to go over in a very short amount of time. But, uh, you know, that's at least the last of the meta-ethical stuff that we're going to be dealing with in this semester. So the first five PowerPoints again, uh, first one being an introduction of philosophy and moral philosophy, and then the next four. PowerPoints 2, 3, 4, and 5 all deal with this question of grounding ethics. Um, if you are, again, in my class, then that's the material that's going to show up on the very first test. I've given you study guides. Now I've given you some video lectures to help you walk through the PowerPoints. Hopefully, it's been helpful and useful. Uh, if not, I apologize. I know this stuff can be very difficult, and I do encourage you to not give up um, where you get frustrated, just try to take your time. Keep asking yourself, you know, where's the main idea? Uh, you know, what, what, what are we trying to talk about? Um, slow down a little bit. If you need to form study groups, do some outside reading. Um, I encourage you to do that. But until next time, good luck studying. Um, hang in there, and I will see you next time.